Here on BBC One, we present a special omnibus profile of the world-famous Bolshoi Ballet. Andrei Sliepa of the Bolshoi Ballet, dancing Le Corsair, 1986. July 1986, the Bolshoi is back in London. What shall I say about the repertoire that we have brought here on tour? Это балет из нашей точки зрения наших самых замечательных советских композиторов. These ballets, from our point of view, are uh, of our best composers. Это Дмитрий Шестакович. They are Dmitry Shostakovich. Sergei Prokofiev. Sergei Prokofiev. Yes, Sergei Prokofiev. Ah, yeah. Yeah, Ram Khachaturyan.
When the Bolshoi Ballet first visited London in 1956, much of the attention was focused on their prima ballerina, the great star Galina Ulanova. She still travels with the company as one of their leading teachers. It is uh, both pleasant and slightly bitter. Because uh, now I am in a different quality. But it is pleasant for me that I work with young people and it supports me, my spirit. I am glad that I've come here once again. What seats are you going for? Um, the balcony stores. How much are they? Two guineas each. Seems rather a lot of money to pay after waiting for so It is, but I mean they're coming for all prices. There's no size the limit, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Galina Ulanova as Giselle, 1956. It was all rather strange. You see, we're used to our own audience. If they're watching a performance and it's not the first time they've seen it, then there's always a certain amount of applause at particular moments. But here in London, it was very quiet. You had the feeling that, as we say, you could have heard a fly flying in the audience. That's how quiet it was. And only when it was all over was there a huge outburst of applause. Every second of silence seemed like an eternity to us. And we thought the whole thing had flopped, that they hadn't understood us, and it was absolutely terrifying for us. But in actual fact, it turned out they were completely absorbed. And maybe because it was all rather new and they were so gripped by it, they had decided not to clap and distract the artists from their performance. As well as Ulanova, the Bolshoi brings with it an outstanding company of dancers and teachers, a roll call of some of the greatest names in ballet. The principal male dancer, Irek Mukamedov. Raisa Struchkova, one of the great stars of the 60s. There's the man who's run the Bolshoi for more than 20 years and made an indelible impact on world dance, Yuri Grigorovich one of the stars of the present generation, Andris Liepa. Ludmila Seminyaka, and another prima ballerina for more than two decades, Natalia Besmetnova. Tonight, Omnibus tells the story of one of the great ballet companies of the world, its past, present and future, with film performances from their current European tour and unique archive film of great interpretations from the past. We visit the Bolshoi in Moscow to watch rehearsals and classes, and we trace the evolution of the Bolshoi style over the last 70 years. We talk to the legendary names in Soviet ballet, performers and teachers, to the stars of the future, and to the man whose name is synonymous with the Bolshoi, its artistic director and chief choreographer, Yuri Grigorovich. Everyone is dancing. Even in everyday life, everyone dances. It's some sort of emotional outburst, an expression of oneself. It's a desire to see through other people our inner thoughts, our fantasies and so on. The theatrical art of ballet, as we know, was born in Italy and spread to France. Then many European countries became interested in the system of dance, the balletic system of dance. And the art travelled quickly around the world and came to Russia. Many of our European teachers, whom we remember well, starting from the 18th century, brought this art of ballet to us. 
And I'd say it suited us very well, because it seems to have an affinity with the Russian character. The way the Italians sing is the way the Russians dance, in my view. Choreography is founded on two principles. These are classical dance, let's say the system of classical dance, and the folk dance. It's the fusion of the one and the other that constitutes the basis of the production. All other styles draw on the classical ballet, that is, on the classical style of ballet. And classical ballet, in its turn, insofar as it is a living style, takes on everything new that it sees, both in life, from other styles, and from other understandings of the nature of interpretative art, of plasticity. That's undoubtable. This ballet has changed greatly. That is, it changes with time. Every era leaves its stamp on it. Adagio from the Golden Age. The dancers Irek Mukhamedov and Natalia Besmetnova. Natalia Besmetnova has danced leading roles with the Bolshoi for 20 years. When I was little, I was always going on at my mother about wanting to be a ballerina, without really fully understanding the meaning of the word, or what being a ballerina actually meant. I just wanted to dance, 
And so everything followed on quite naturally. When I went to school, I went to ordinary dancing classes. Then I danced in a group at the Palace of Culture. That was also just amateur. When I was in that group, I was advised to try and apply to the Choreographic Institute of the Bolshoi Theatre, which was part of the whole Bolshoi setup. My mother and I went and applied. I went through three auditions. There was a great deal of competition, and they accepted me. That's how my artistic life began. There are 2,000 applicants every year for the Bolshoi Ballet School. After a rigorous process of selection, only 80 children will get in. The students will train for eight years in classical and modern dance. The ultimate goal is the Bolshoi company, but of the 80 who go through the course, at the very most, a dozen will become Bolshoi dancers. While they're here, the ballet school will take over their entire education. My past is like that of many others. I graduated from the old ballet school in Pushichnaya Street, and when I was studying there, I dreamt of a school, of a city of ballet that would have its own stage and everything. Then I was a ballerina at the Bolshoi Theatre for 27 years and danced the whole repertoire. And now I've been director of the school for the past 25 years. And when I was appointed, I set about realizing my dream. The school cost a lot, six million. The state gives me as much money as I need to employ all the best teachers. Our academy has 600 children and 300 teachers. The children aren't all Muscovites. They also come from different Soviet republics, although we have 20 ballet schools in the country and 60 opera and ballet theatres. We take children at the age of 10 and we train them for eight years. We're scientific. We're now studying the coordination of movement with a psychologist who explains how coordination, which is very important for ballet, can be used in teaching. We're now studying biomechanics. We have equipment which helps us to develop the natural abilities of a child, in particular the turnout, splits, the jump. So you see, we're using everything that will help us to train a first-class ballerina. So that's our task, to train ballet dancers for the 90s. It's rather like taking an uncut diamond. Every teacher, like a jeweler, cuts the form. And when a pupil finishes school, she's a polished diamond. Молодцы. Спинка крепкая. Ласки прямо.
The school has turned out many of the great Bolshoi stars. One of the most exciting dancers of the new generation is Nina Ananyashvili. To tell the truth, all ballet dancers, not just in Moscow, but everywhere, dream of visiting the Bolshoi. Even if only just to get in to see a performance. It was difficult for me to even imagine that I would ever actually work in the Bolshoi. It was something sacred. I thought it would be impossible to even enter the Bolshoi building. Just to come and watch one of the ballets would have been a great thrill. My family is not a ballet family at all. My father's a geologist, my mother a philologist. I was born in Tbilisi, and I started off in an ordinary school. I did sport and figure skating, and I did them quite seriously. Then at the age of 10, I went to a choreographic institute. And I spent four years there. Then I moved to Moscow. To follow her career, Nina has had to uproot from her family and indeed move to a completely different republic within the Soviet Union. Her home is 3,000 miles from Moscow in Georgia. The fact that I could move to Moscow at all was thanks to Babushka, my grandmother. Because they wouldn't have let me come on my own. I was very little, and she gave up her work for me. This is our ninth year of living together, and we're still friends. She's seen me dance more than anyone. She hardly misses any of the performances or premieres. She knows what's what. Nina rehearses the role of Kitri in Don Quixote. The mentor and teacher at the Bolshoi is herself a famous interpreter of the same role, Raisa Struchkova. between us. We're friends. She's not just a teacher, she's a wonderful person. I'm very happy that I work with her. She helps me a lot. Хотя позади уже десятки выступлений в балете Дон Кихот, подготовка к очередному спектаклю идет как к премьере. Раиса Стручкова с Владимиром Тихоновым и репетитором Тамарой Никитиной еще и еще раз проходят свои партии. Ballets such as Don Quixote, Giselle, they're all part of our heritage. Young people nowadays have greater opportunities than we had. For example, I graduated from the ballet school during the most difficult period, the Second World War. We suffered a lot at that time. It was very difficult. But nonetheless, our teachers managed to pass these traditions on to us. We do the same for the young people now. 
But on the foundations of the old school, something new is being born. Nothing stands still. And so now they perform, having absorbed all the traditions of the old classical school. Nina Ananyashvili performs at the Bolshoi in Don Quixote for the first time, here with Valery Anisimov. The music by Leon Minkus, original choreography by Petipa and Gorski. Two, Don Quixote's Dream. From Act 3, in the ballroom. This is the goal of all the Bolshoi students, the company theatre in Sverdlovsk Square. This is how it looked in 1780. It was called the Petrovsky Theatre, but this first building and then a second were totally destroyed by fire. It was the third theatre built on this site in 1856 that became known as the Bolshoi, the everyday Russian word meaning big. The oldest ballet still in the repertoire is Giselle, first performed in the 1840s, and the dominant figure in the Bolshoi of that period was the French choreographer Marius Petipa. His choreography of Raimunda, Swan Lake, and here Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty is still performed after nearly a century and a half. The dancers are Andres Liepa and Nina Ananyashvili. By the end of the 19th century, the Bolshoi was the second most important ballet company in Russia. It was still regarded as the poor relation of the Mariinsky Company of St. Petersburg, now the Kirov. But Moscow society patronized their Bolshoi, and thanks to the efforts of one brilliant innovator, the audiences saw their ballet develop into a mature theatrical form. The extraordinary Alexander Gorsky was director of the Bolshoi from 1899 to 1924. 
He became known for the lavishness of his staging. He was a storyteller, an investigator of character and emotion, and he married ballet to symphonic music. And the first of the Bolshoi stars began to emerge. The idols of the Moscow public in the early 1900s were the husband and wife team of Ekaterina Geltzer and Vasily Tikomirov. This fragment of them dancing together was filmed in 1913. With the revolution of 1917, the Bolshoi Theatre itself, the biggest public auditorium in Moscow, played an extraordinary part in history. The actual proclamation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was made from its stage by Lenin. But the future of the Bolshoi as an artistic centre was in jeopardy. There was much debate about how the theatre and the ballet might be developed as an enlightenment for the many rather than a spectacle for the privileged few, and some saw the Bolshoi ballet itself as the repository of bourgeois culture. It was under threat of closure. The first People's Commissar for Enlightenment, Anatoly Lunachowski, defended the arts and the Bolshoi in a public speech. Это единственная сохранившаяся синхронная съемка Луначарского. Мы можем видеть его и слышать его голос. The ballet was safe. The Bolshoi company would continue to perform for all the people. Here in 1923, in front of thousands on the steps of the theatre. For the last 120 years, the dancers of the Bolshoi Company have arrived at this building every day, except Monday, for classes, rehearsals and performance. There are 25 ballets in the current repertoire, and 33 operas too. The theatre has 700 technicians on the staff, 85 of them stagehands, who have to cope with the constant turnaround of up to 14 public performances a week. Five different technical workshops employing 300 people. The costume department has a staff of 34. The administration has to organize the working lives of 300 dancers and more than 500 opera singers and musicians. There are well-established traditions. Dressing rooms are shared between the dancers and the opera singers. And men always change on the right of the stage, women on the left.
A ballerina might need ten pairs of shoes a week and at least two per performance. Shoes are made to different hardnesses for different ballets and at the Bolshoi's own workshop, one shoemaker is assigned to work exclusively for her own particular group of dancers. Class, that's the origin of a dancer's life. At the school, from the first lesson, he learns the principles of classical dance, that is, the understanding of his profession. And throughout his life, throughout the eight or nine years of study at the school, and for the rest of his artistic career, the class remains the basis of the dancer's life and work. Dancers are dancers, performances are performances, but in the center of life you have the daily class. Many of the leading Bolshoi dancers make the transition from performer to teacher. In the case of Boris Akimov, he's taking daily classes and still dancing leading roles on the stage. When a teacher both dances and teaches, I think it's important especially in graduate and professional classes. I myself, as a dancer, gain a lot from this, and I grow. Even having worked many years in the theatre, I grow and transform with the young dancers. And the result is a sort of mutual enrichment. Certainly technique is developing these days, particularly in male dancers. It is adopting many elements of pure sport. The dancers are getting stronger and more athletic. There is a greater amplitude in the movements themselves, and the jumps especially are much broader than they were before. You can learn to teach, certainly. There's an institute for that in Moscow, and one in Leningrad, which turns out and trains teachers. But a real teacher, just like a real dancer, has to be born, and must have a particular talent for this. The teaching traditions of the Bolshoi are handed down through the generations, the legendary Alexander Gorsky passed on his legacy to one of his pupils, another leading dancer and ballet master, Asaf Messera. At the age of 83, Messera is still taking daily classes at the Bolshoi. I received a great deal from Gorsky, especially on the choreographic side. He was not only a teacher, but a choreographer as well. After Gorsky died, I moved to Tikhomirov's class. Vasily Tikhomirov had been an outstanding dancer. The lyric choreographers of that time laid more stress on the small movements. Today, these small movements are gone. It's all broad movements. It could be a result of the content of many of these ballets. Sometimes it seems a shame that some of the smaller movements are no longer with us.
Once in the Bolshoi theatre, the rule was such that you had to dance what you were told, in the corps de ballet or whatever. I was immediately given some parts to learn. Then, a couple of months later, I was given Chetni Predasarojnost, La Fille Malgarde. It just so happened that all the male dancers had fallen ill. There was no one left to dance. And whoever was in charge said to me, you'll have to dance in the performance tonight. Dance what? I asked. There are a lot of parts in it. Kolas. What? I said. With whom? With Kandaurava. But I've never even rehearsed with her. You have to rehearse. How can she rehearse? She's got a performance tonight. She can't rehearse. So what can we do? Before the performance. He'll rehearse every act during the preceding interval. And that was it. I rehearsed in the interval before every act and danced in the evening performance. Gorski's choreography for that ballet, La Fille Malgarde. The male role danced here in 1986 by Vladimir Lyakin. In those days, Male dancing was more a question of paying attention to female dancing. The man just supported the woman. He danced only a little. His movements, as it seemed to me then, were primitive. He could have done more. That's what I tried to do. In my time, I concentrated on new movements and a whole host of movements they do now were done by me for the first time. Messera in 1940, Dance with a Ribbon. Messera in The Fountain of Bakshizarai. 1936. The music, Asafiev. Choreography, Sakharov. Messera's own choreography of Spring Waters, music by Rachmaninoff. The dancers Maria Bulova and Leonid Nikonov.
другая киноретопись. И в эти годы Большой разделял трудную судьбу страны. Его артисты выступали перед воинами на фронтах Великой Отечественной войны. Перед выздоравливающими воинами танцуют Ольга Лепешинская и Петр Гусев. Мессера was director and chief choreographer when the company moved to Volga. He ran the Bolshoi in exile. I had agreed to be artistic director on condition that when we came back to Moscow I should be relieved of all that because to do so many jobs at once was impossible. After the war, Messera returned to his first love, teaching the very best of the Bolshoi dancers, what they call the class of perfection. I tried out all my ideas on my own legs. It's a sense of proportion that's so important. Sometimes you get a situation where you could give a bit more movement and ruin someone's legs. The class of perfection is for established artists because they have to keep practicing all their lives, not just at school. At school they have a defined program. It goes through eight years. Each class has its own exercises which must be learnt. But the class of perfection is for established artists who have to know everything already. Filming this modern-day class of perfection under Messera again gives us a breathtaking lineup of some of the top names in world dancing. There's a sense of great theatrical dynasties here too. Mikhail Lavrovsky is the son of Leonid Lavrovsky, one of the most influential choreographers and directors of the post-war years. The ballerina Maya Plisetskaya, now in her 60s, still dancing to her own new choreography. She's a favorite pupil of Messera. In fact, she's his niece, and he's guided her through a long and distinguished career. Many consider Vladimir Vasiliev to be the finest male dancer of his generation. He's now known internationally as a choreographer, and he's still dancing leading roles, as is his wife, Ekaterina Maximova. In 1963, she captivated British audiences during her first Western tour. Alexei Fedeyachev, one of the new generation of male dancers, follows his father, Nikolai Fedeyachev, here partnering Ulanova in Giselle. Another tradition, the married couple as stage partners. The younger Fedeyachev has just married Ala Mikhachinko. Andris Liepa, already a Bolshoi star in his early 20s. His father, Maris, created the role of Crassus in the ballet Spartacus. This is not athletics, where you can jump as you like and land as you like, so long as you've made the height. No. Here you have to adopt a specific position, and from that position come gently down to earth. That way, the jump will leave an impression. Expressiveness of movement, that is essential. Because without that expressiveness, there is no dancing. Technique on its own will give you nothing.
Сейчас пальцем плохо он с тем большим, да? Я да. Со всеми пальцами. А да, вот видишь, как вот здесь вот, ну, 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 как же здесь вот все, в Лондоне вот. Знаешь, знаешь, это вот надо почаще ходить в баньку почаще и попарить вот так вот. Хорошо. Немножко подготовить. Обязательно. Если я то занимаюсь, не смысл, что ты вот это сделал. А что все прочувствовал, зашла в пятую позицию нога, да. чтобы корпус стоял. Открыто, когда ты вынимаешь ногу вперед. Не сутул, не так входит. Раскрытый век. Должен быть абсолютно. In 1976, Mikhail Lavrovsky dances with Bismertnova to his father's choreography of Romeo and Juliet. Music by Prokofiev. Lavrovsky had worked closely with Prokofiev in the creation of the ballet. When I was a boy, my father used to take me to Prokofiev's dacha. From what I know and remember, the creation of Romeo and Juliet was a real shared venture. Apart from the fact that Prokofiev was a genius at composing, he wasn't the kind of man you could pressurize. The times were very difficult. War, you understand. So many dead throughout the world. Our country lost more than anyone. And on stage, grand passions were called for. Do you see, you couldn't put silly little elves on stage at a time like that, as I see it, when millions of families were being wiped out. What emerged was Romeo and Juliet. They made a film of it too in 1954, Leonid Lavrovsky directing. The passions were sweeping. That was what touched people to the core, not least because of the style of the production, what we now call drama ballet, in the best possible sense. That was a new step. And the production, these are not my words, but what was said in England, France, America, was a milestone, not just for Soviet choreography. The part of Juliet had been created by prima ballerina Galina Ulanova. It doesn't happen every year, but every few years a more talented group of people appears. Then you get a group where everyone's the same. Then another talented one arrives. I think this applies to lots of areas. New choreographers have coincided with new themes. And there's been the desire to show something new and to express it in a different way. In ballet, people are used to thinking a ballerina or dancer just works with her legs. No, above all, she has to use her head too, to be intelligent, develop herself. In any of the arts, in any walk of life, you have to use your head and really understand what you're doing and be very concentrated. If you want to be a dancer, you have to take a lot from life. And put it all in a little bag here, so that it mounts up. These days I don't work with a great many people. There's only about 20 that I work with. 
And the first thing I do is to try to arouse in them an understanding, so that, to put it crudely, they don't just imitate like monkeys. The grown-ups used to tell me, you've got to do it like this or like that. And I used to say, I do it my own way. And they'd say, well, we're relying on our experience, and you're wrong. You mustn't do it like that. And I'd say, I have to feel myself when I've done something badly. So you see, there's a sort of dialogue here between comrades. And of course, I have to keep myself in shape, even if only my appearance. I can't keep my face in shape, but I practice even now to keep my figure. You have to have a real live person on the stage, someone who shows his soul in whatever form, whatever expression. Otherwise it'll be boring and superficial. And you could only watch our beautiful art for half an hour. And then you'd say it wasn't interesting, regardless of the good music. You can have performances like that, but if it's going to be a real performance, and we do stage very big productions, then the contents have to be very clear. With Galina Ulanova as their leading female dancer, the Bolshoi had gone international during the 1950s. This is their own filmed record of a 1959 tour of America. The commentary is in English. The premiere was successful beyond all our expectations. The ovation lasted for a quarter of an hour. The curtain rose and fell 18 times. Joy reigned behind the scenes too. Hardly had Leonid Lavrovsky, producer of the ballet, had a chance to congratulate Danov, Romeo in the production, and Galina Ulanova, Juliet, and they were attacked by a swarm of photographers. This hugely successful visit to the States also brought to world attention the work of a brilliant young choreographer from Leningrad, Yuri Grigorovich. For the last 22 years, he's run the Bolshoi Ballet. My childhood was spent in the circus ring. I saw all those horses. I watched the incredible work the trainer put in when he was trying to teach this or that horse actress to do this or that trick or somehow coordinate their movements. It was incredible. Here, absolute accuracy was essential. This must have affected my consciousness because I really like this accurate attention to the text. And I love the circus. It's a very professional and precise art form. You can't afford to make mistakes. Especially not if you're working on the trapeze high up in the big top. If you're not accurate there, it's a disaster. 1986, Swan Lake. The music by Tchaikovsky, choreography by Petipa. Alexei Fedeyevchev. Fedeyevchev's partner is Ala Mikolchenko. Балета хороши, как сказал Бальер. 
All forms of ballet are good, as Molly has said, except the boring. So I think you can stage how you want, what you want, but you must never forget for whom you are staging it. Because in the end, the theatre is an organism which influences people very strongly. It tries to express the most human thoughts that people have. To show through our art, a person's inner life. Vladimir Vasiliev and Maris Liepa, two outstanding performers in Aram Khachaturian's ballet Spartacus, staged by the choreographer Grigorovich. the male dancers revealed a vividly distinctive feature of the Soviet choreographical school. Spartacus is one of those performances which is the fulfillment of that tremendous emotional strength which exists in our male corps de ballet. Like in music, it's through the fantastic emotional and physical strength that the artist expresses himself. My first Spartacus was Vladimir Vasiliev, a wonderful dancer, for me one of the greatest in the world. We put him on the scales before the performance and after the performance. He lost six kilograms. You can imagine the strength and exertion of those three big acts for an artist. And of course, it's not just the strength of physical exertion, but unbelievable emotional exertion as well. Now, we've brought on a young Spartacus, Irek Muhammadov. A Tatar by descent. Vasiliev was the hero of the inner life. But Irek, through his unusual oriental fluidity of expression, gives the whole part a different colouring. It's astonishing. I prefer to work with younger artists on new works. I'm always interested in what the younger people think of me. For me, he's Tsar and God. Yuri Nikolaevich brought me onto the stage of the Bolshoi Theatre 
dragged me. And I'm very grateful to him. I don't know what Yuri Nikolaevich's opinion of me is. I think it's good, because I try to do everything he asks, and I try to do everything from the soul, not just any old how. I always give a hundred, two hundred percent. I think that we, in the ballet, especially with our movements and work, have to have a czar in our heads. Otherwise, we can shatter and fall in half on stage. Nothing will work out. There'll be a mess on the stage and the performance will be a failure. But when it's controlled and at the same time preserves the image, the fluidity, the jumps, then it's even better and it shows. To dance these heroic, dramatic, expressive ballets all the time is impossible. You need to mix them with more lyrical, romantic works, where you can relax a little bit. They're easier. To jump continuously, to give the whole of yourself continuously throughout a performance is impossible. You'll end up breaking something or doing yourself a terrible injury. Bukhamedov is dancing with Grigorovich's wife, Natalia Bismetnova. I hope there still be something left of me by the time I'm 30. You know, I have my own law. The more you look after yourself, the less strength you have. I think maybe that'll help me, even when I'm 30. Maybe I won't jump so high, won't get so high off the floor. But all the same, I'll be giving everything. Giving everything in performance, everything in rehearsal, everything in my work. All the more so, since we love our profession so much, the ballet, we simply can't live without it. Балет в удивительном единстве рождается вместе с актером. The ballet is an amazing unity that is born with the artist. If you've been lucky enough to work with a really great artist, I'm not talking about someone who tries to do your thinking for you, but someone who can fulfill precisely what it is that you want. It's a great stroke of luck. In my time, there have been a lot of artists with whom I've worked with great interest and who have really given me great satisfaction in life. For example, in Ivan the Terrible, Vladimirov, with whom I worked from the very beginning. The man was literally possessed by the part, possessed. For him, I came to the rehearsal. He was already sitting near my office in his cloak with a whip. He was waiting for me to arrive. He had his scepter, and he was sitting there, longing to start the rehearsal.
Владимиров, он э, танцует. Юрий Владимиров dances Ivan the Terrible excellently. And his makeup, his fluency, are an expression of the real Ivan IV. I've adopted a slightly different approach. For me, the ballet begins when Ivan was 18 years old. More or less a young man, just come to power. He's kinder, very much in love with Anastasia. As Anastasia, Natalia Bismetnova recreates with the 26-year-old Mukhamedov the role she danced a decade ago with Vladimirov. Of course, it's very interesting to dance with different partners. And incidentally, the performances turn out differently. With one partner, you have one performance, with another, another. Working with different partners is enriching in some respects and brings some interesting nuances and colors to the performance. To some degree, I like changing partners. It gives me something and enables me to open myself up and other sides of my character and relationship with the role. As a rule, I always fall in love with the artists I work with. That's nothing to do with my wife, whom I fell in love with and married. That's another story. I'm talking about the artists with whom I work. I love moving on almost immediately with an artist into the next production. Because we begin to get used to one another, to really understand what's needed. We don't have to waste a lot of effort on getting attuned to each other's thoughts and images. Both Ivan the Terrible and Spartacus are ballets created by Grigorovich in the 60s and 70s, but his policy at the Bolshoi is also to continue to revise and represent the classics. One of our tasks is this. In one's theatre, one must show the best possible examples of the old classics, the best, that is, from one's own point of view, naturally. In time, of course, everything becomes out of date, not only in performance, but also in life and in us ourselves. We need to add some more contemporary touches to productions, to make them watchable for a modern audience. Ludmila Semenyaka specializes in leading classical roles. She's a pupil of Ulanova, and she began her career with the Kirov company in Leningrad. <laughs> I think that if you could combine the Leningrad style of dance with the Moscow style, it would be simply wonderful if it was successful. Because Leningrad's technical purity, its severity of style, the refinement of the Leningrad school is very much filled out and brought alive under the influence of Moscow's openness and bravura. When I went to Moscow and started dancing performances in the theatre, it gave me great spiritual freedom.
In my view, the greatest form of expression in ballet is the dance itself, like an aria in an opera. The recitative is fine, but it will never replace the aria. And I think that pure dance is the highest manifestation of choreographic skill. Of course, dance is varied. Drama ballets, abstract ballets, we touch on different themes. But pure dance is the essence of ballet. A 1978 performance of Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker, choreography by Grigorovich. Vasiliev and Maximova have become one of the greatest partnerships in the history of the Bolshoi. and not only in the rehearsal studio. If a performer is doing something new, he's always thinking about it, at home, out in the street. Even for an old ballet, you're constantly re-evaluating what you did before. It's we who have changed. It's not as if we decide, well, I've danced this ballet the same way for three years now. It's time for a change. I must change my interpretation. And then after ten years, make another deliberate change. It's never been that way with me. But Giselle has gradually changed of its own accord. Katya Maximova herself was scarcely out of the ballet school in 1958 before she was dancing leading roles. Here she prepares for Giselle with her teacher Galina Ulanova, herself a great Giselle from the past. Here is Galina Ulanova's successor on the stage. Katya Maximova is one of the many who is furthering the fine traditions of the Russian ballet. <laughs> Gradually, it became clear to me, not all at once, but gradually, that I must express my attitude to Giselle in my own way, as my own heart dictated, through my own thoughts, and not try to change myself, not try to be someone else. You must be sincere on stage. The audience is always very sensitive to that. Especially as I did not have the perfect physical attributes that the marvellous dancers of the past were blessed with. Moscow, 1986. Again, Giselle. This rehearsal taken by Asaf Messera.
Vasiliev and Maximova are also known in the Bolshoi as strong-minded individualists with their own very positive views about working in such a large company. In our theatre nowadays, you go off on tour. You're away for two or three months. You come back and ask, well, what's been happening? And the answer comes back, nothing much. So-and-so's dance Swan Lake, so-and-so Don Quixote. And you say, nothing much, such an event. How did it go? And they answer, all right, she didn't fall over. And what about so-and-so? He didn't fall over either. It's somehow, we're used to looking at things from a different point of view. We're used to each performance being an event. How did he do it? Because each dancer has to do it his way. And as for this, he didn't fall over. We fell over. All the performances differed from each other. The 32 fuetes weren't the point. Of course, we all did them. They were important for all of us. We all worked away at our technique. But the real interest was, what are you dancing it for? And didn't lie in the 32 fuetes themselves. Now there's a new way. 32 fuetes in Swan Lake, 32 here, 32 there, learn the part, don't fall down. And that's it. You're ready to go on. The difference between the parts seems to lie entirely in the fact that you put feathers on your head for one and a flower behind your ear for the other. I wish there was more of a search for something personal in all this. If we simply close our eyes and say the only correct way is the way we do it, then we ourselves would never have made any progress in what we do. Right, Katyusha? Right. No, I agree. Another of the great individualists of the Bolshoi is Maya Plisitskaya, here receiving the Lenin Prize in 1964. It's one of the highest accolades for an artist in the Soviet Union. Today is one of the happiest days in my life. I've been awarded a Lenin Prize. Plesetskaya is known for a radical and adventurous approach to the role she plays and to the new ballets that over the last 15 years she's encouraged, sometimes directed and choreographed herself. She became a soloist for the Bolshoi in 1945 and over the next decade she made her name in classical roles like Odette Odile in Swan Lake, 
Kitri in Don Quixote and Raimonda. From the earliest days she was famous for a kind of formal perfection that few have equaled. Formalism is a marvellous thing. I love pure form. Even form for form's sake, there's something in that. Rembrandt drew a golden chain on a black background for the sake of form. It's absolutely beautiful. It's the same in ballet, or in any of the arts. Mastery of form is a fine thing. But if in addition to that, you have the art of hearing the music, and you have to hear it, you have to dance it, you have to sing it with your body. Then, in addition to technique, you will have expressiveness. We don't have words. Besides the face, we have the gesture, the body, and the music. None of them need translating. It's common to everyone. And so you can't go in for mere technical tricks, for example, a pirouette that means nothing. Unless, of course, it's appropriate, an expression of some sort of inner feeling. Or there has to be a different kind of choreography. There has to be both these sorts of ballets. And if they're only technical ballets, this impoverishes the very word ballet. Because ballet is, in addition, the art of plasticity, of fluent expression, which affects everything. And technique, all on its own, doesn't affect anything. Sometimes they say here that ballet is trying to do something that doesn't suit it. And that's not right, because ballet has slightly compromised itself by just having pirouettes and flashes of leg. Of course, that sort of ballet, I agree, doesn't express anything. Maya Plisetska admits that the subject of Lev Tolstoy's Anna Karenina has been attracting her and composer Rodion Shedrin for a long time. In the new ballet, the famous ballerina made her debut as a director and choreographer. (laughs) 
The realization of a great prosaic work in ballet is in itself a risky matter. The production differs from the classical traditions of Russian ballet. It is in a way an attempt by Maya Plisetska to portray the complicated feelings of the heroine of the novel in a pantomime dance. The thing is that Chekhov uses very few words which actually express anything. But all the same, a tragedy is taking place. You have this situation possibly in Chekhov's difficult plays. He sometimes even has moments where people are simply drinking tea and not doing anything. It's boring country life at the dacha. And at this time, their lives are collapsing. This is all between the lines and not expressed at all. And this time of tragedy can only be expressed by plasticity, fluent movement and music. And that's how it's conveyed by Shedrin. Other dancers of her generation, Maya Plisetskaya has had some opportunities to introduce new work into the repertoire. But there are those who say it's not enough. It's a constant point of debate within the company itself. Our problem at the moment is that the repertoire is limited, even in stylistic terms. Now what was the Bolshoi always famous for? For the grand full-length ballets, marvelous decor, big productions with a full corps de ballet and magnificent soloists for individuals in the ballet. But the reason I've brought up this question of different styles is because it is only the big theatres that can provide the audience with a wide variety of styles, not the little theatres. When people go to Beja's theatre, for instance, they go because they want to see Beja's choreography. When they go to Covent Garden, they want to see the work of a variety of choreographers. It's the same thing as reading one and the same author all the time. Any educated person will have the books of a large number of different authors in his library. He'll prefer one of them to the others. But he can't read day in, day out, only Dostoevsky, only Tolstoy, only Chekhov or only Somerset more. He can't. It's not possible. With reading, it's our choice. If you want, you read, and you read what you want. But the theatre, as we've said, is a living thing, and in the theatre you have to think, and to give the rising generation the opportunity to show what it can do to the fullest extent. I think that's the greatest problem for our theatre. Innovation is not a profession. You're either new or not new. There are no other possibilities. No artist is crazy enough to want to be old or uninteresting or not new. Everyone wants to be new, talented and interesting, but some succeed and others don't. Time will decide who was really new and who did something. We all strive for the new. Moreover, everyone has their own ideas of what's new, and every country is new in a different way, because art in every country 
works on different levels. That's quite normal. The misfortune of the Bolshoi theatre is that we can't experiment and run the risk of being mediocre and uninteresting. We have to do things according to the principles of the Bolshoi theatre. The Bolshoi theatre must do well, and this hinders us. It hinders us. You know, when I saw the ballet Giselle for the first time, I fell in love with it immediately. Because I think that the very soul of ballet is incorporated in it. I'm attracted to its romanticism, its beauty, the choreography, and even to what some people might call the naive dramatic music. The whole combination gives it a sort of unusual... Well, put it this way, this ballet appeals to me enormously with its sort of touching nature, its unusual purity, and of course the romanticism, which none of us has enough of today in our hectic lives. March 1986, and the Bolshoi stage is prepared for a new Giselle. Giselle is such a difficult ballet. It's difficult in all respects. Yet, one must dance it very naturally for it to work. Especially in our theatre, where so many famous ballerinas dance. Nina will be dancing with Andres Sliepa, they're regular partners, but it's the first time they've performed Giselle together. They'll be rehearsing under Raisa Struchkova. It is very important for me to find my own personality. Although, of course, people will still compare me with my father. All my working life has been connected with Nina, both at the school and during my first years in the theatre. I have danced with this ballerina for practically eight years. It's a very long time. You could say we have a mutual understanding. We are already an established partnership. Я 
They're different, and it's a very good thing that they are different. They each bring something, I don't know why, maybe because they feel the world differently. Our future lies with them. They will take our ballet forwards. This ballet is the most successful in so far as it has lasted so many years and never grows old. And it's all the more difficult for us, the young dancers, to dance Giselle now, because times have changed. We all grow farther away from the original choreography. And we must preserve that style which exists in the ballet. And yet, at the same time, we have to interpret it in our own way. I remember when I danced, I was asked, what's your most enjoyable moment after the performance? And I answered, if the performance goes well, my happiest moment is standing under a shower with cool water pouring over me and thinking to myself, that's it, the performance is over. Because when I go to bed, I'm already starting to think about the next day's performance. Eyes, eyes, I beg you, pay great attention to the expression of your eyes. It's no accident that they say the eyes are the mirror of the soul. Eyes express everything. They express happiness. They express doubt. When you hurry towards them and want to ask, is it true? No, I just imagined it. The eyes express this. I must read all this in your eyes, and you must be able to do the same, to look into your soul. Sometimes I used to go on stage when I was first dancing and think I was thoroughly warmed up inside. But when I wanted to smile, I felt a constraint. The muscles of my face convulsed. I spoke to my father and he said, you must understand, your face has the same kind of muscles as your legs and arms, which you have to warm up before going on stage. If you don't warm them up, you can't dance. So your smile, your face, needs to be warmed up before the start. I realized that he was right. Now, before any appearance on stage, like an actor or singer, I warm up the muscles of my face. Then I achieve a natural smile. Every emotion can be reflected in the face, because the muscles are prepared. Every impulse from the brain, which says smile, leads to a good, normal smile, and not one of those twisted grimaces. You feel a responsibility when you lead your partner in a new role. When you dance together, it's a very interesting moment when you feel this responsibility, not only for yourself, how you dance, but also for your partner, a ballerina who is dancing the part for the very first time. Certainly, I have inside myself a composite image. I can't name one individual from whom I take everything, but from each dancer, especially from that galaxy of great dancers like Vasiliev, Lavrovsky, Vladimirov, Fadejev. I try to take something I can use for myself.
Мне очень трудно было решить. It was very difficult for me to decide to dance this part, because of course I was nervous. Such great ballerinas as Ulanova, Biesmetnova, Maximova, my teacher, Raisa Skruchkova, they all dance this ballet so fantastically, and they're all still alive in the eyes of the audience. To go on stage after them and dance the same part is a great responsibility.
мне кажется, что вот будущее Большого театра... As I see it, the future of the Bolshoi Ballet lies in us finding and opening up new ways, not only for the dancers, because you can't talk of the development of dancers as separate from the development of choreography. I'm sure we'll find these new ways in the sphere of the language of choreography. As you know, Russia is such an enigmatic country that it always comes up with surprises. You know, I honestly don't know where the ballet is heading, where it's going, because they travel a great deal, maybe even too much, and they get exhausted and prone to injury. So they don't really do anything new, and you can't not do anything new, because, as we know, what stands still goes backwards. We have a new generation of young male dancers. I don't know how things will be for them in the future, but I like very much what I see now. They're really young. There's the young Liepa, young Muhammadov, Fadiechev, Vietrov. Tarandaz is a very good dancer. They're all young people who, if they can avoid turning their talent into a cliché, you know our tradition of self-criticism, could, I believe, become great and interesting artists. In the theatre at the moment, we're getting such a quantity of new and interesting people. I like the Bolshoi Theatre's new generation. They're completely different. I'm interested in what they think. They somehow think differently from us. Contact is born out of an understanding between me and them. And when we understand each other, even though we may be standing in different positions, but we do understand each other, then you get some interesting things happening. I simply can't say what will happen in the Bolshoi Theatre tomorrow, let alone in the future. I just don't know. Their present tour has taken the Bolshoi to Brazil, Argentina, Austria, Ireland and the United Kingdom. Next week they go on to France. Next year's major tour will be a return visit to the United States. Over the past few weeks in Great Britain and Ireland, the Bolshoi company has been seen on stage by more than a quarter of a million people.
Well, on Saturday evening, BBC Two is screening the Bolshoi Ballet live as they perform various works, including excerpts from The Nutcracker, Swan Lake and their much acclaimed Golden Age from London's Riverside Battersea Park. The performance starts at 7.30 on Saturday on BBC Two.